For our scriptures today, Karen has chosen passages from Psalm 139 and Philippians 4. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Mark. And can everyone hear me? I always have to ask that. It's just better than starting over. <laughs> In his book, Beauty, The Invisible Embrace, the late Celtic priest John O'Donohue spoke of the transforming power of beauty as we talked about, as we articulated his words in this morning's call to worship. But he has another thing to say, which I think is gorgeous. When we awaken to the call of beauty, we become aware of new ways of being in the world. Though beauty only visits us and will not linger, it calls us to think, to feel, and to act with more gracefulness in the world and to create and live a life that awakens the beautiful. It is like a divine breath that blows the heart open. The wonder of the beautiful is its ability to surprise us. So and I'm not even gonna have a preliminary here, just listen, <laughs> it'll, it'll unfold. In our consumerist modern culture, beauty has been tragically reduced to the level of a commodity. A commodity which can be bought and sold as a product. It's confused with glamour, with the symmetry of good looks, with the allure of sexuality. It is seen as a privilege of those fortunate enough to possess it or to buy it. And it is marketed to all of us, playing upon our self-indulgence, and egotism, but perhaps even more, playing upon our sense of inferiority that haunts us and drives us to seek to be different than we are. Beauty is not something that can ever be possessed or purchased. Beauty is a transforming presence which comes toward us and embraces us, and its origin is nothing less than divine. Even before Christ, the ancient Greeks believed that beauty stood alongside truth and goodness as the great ideals, the sublime nature and goal of all human deeds. The medieval mind saw beauty as one of the five transcendentals. Here they are, being, the one, the good, the true, the beautiful. Being expressed, the word being expressed the reality of, of all that is, in contrast to there being nothing at all. The one was the ultimate unity of all, despite our distant differences. It was all unified into oneness. These five transcendentals, being the one, the good, the true, and the beautiful, are seen by no less than the great Christian thinker Thomas Aquinas as presence, which give meaning and order to this world. Throughout the centuries, Christianity has held the banner of truth and goodness high, but has been critical 
of too great a focus on what is beautiful, as if misdirected attention will lead to vanity or lust, that things of a bodily nature will move us off track. Christian teachings have often failed to appreciate the spiritual value of beauty, the transforming power for the human soul. But without beauty, truth and goodness would become sterile and brittle imperatives, shoulds, holding no joy, philosophical truths which are not grounded in earthly wonder. Beauty lives in the very depth of things. The 20th century German philosopher Hans George Gadamer spoke about our experience of profound beauty with these words. The experience of the beautiful is the invocation, the calling forth of a potentially whole and holy order of things wherever it may be. Let me say that one more time. The experience of the beautiful is the calling forth of a potentially whole and holy order of things wherever it may be. So beauty is not just a nicety which can be added to life like icing on a cake. It visits us in our suffering as well as our celebration. It makes its presence known at deathbeds, in times of illness, on battlefields, in refugee camps. In a split second, one becomes aware that the struggle they are, at, they are in, however heartrending, has become a transforming one. Bestowing a gift of deep tranquility, an overwhelming feeling of love or gratitude, a recognition of another's profound dignity, or a breathtaking awareness of nature's exquisite expression of itself. When we are surprised by a sudden experience of the beautiful, we are called forth, we are called forward. In that moment, to see a whole and holy order to the things of earth and heaven. I felt this at my mother's graveside recently. In this time of loss, standing in the sunshine by her grave, I felt the holy order of things of heaven and earth. The generation of life spawned by my mother and father and my grandparents before them, whose graves were also nearby, were gathered together to remember, to offer thanks, and to walk forward into our many various lives in a new world, a new generation, another generation. This was God's whole and holy order of things. And it brought me solace. The old adage, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, has a greater depth than how we usually understand it, although everybody has his or her own individual taste, that it does mean that as well. But even more profoundly, it means that beauty lies in our capacity to see beauty. Beauty lies in our capacity to see beauty, to recognize its approach, to revel in its simple grace. The presence of beauty needs not be extraordinary or supernatural to illuminate our lives. Beauty lives in the depths of all things, it's everywhere. Yet this 21st century world is so badly in need of eyes to see its presence and in seeing it, to cherish it and to seek to protect it. Our spirits have become flattened as we have come to view ugliness as normal and acceptable. We are fed trivial and hollow and contentious stories by the media. The decadent and self-serving lifestyles of the famous don't deserve the constant attention that the rest of us give them. Yet we are and continue to be blinded by their allure. We're bombarded with rude words, mean-spirited deeds of political figures, celebrities, radio commentators, talk show hosts, religious leaders, and have come to see their lack of civility as normal, or at least as inevitable. We've accepted the unattractive and uninviting uniformity of corporate box stores, which are surrounded by masses of asphalt parking lots and are accessed only by automobiles on highways, exits all over our country. 
We shell out our money to watch movies with uninspiring storylines, loathsome characters, offensive language, dehumanizing violence, of all of which most of us would make every effort in our own lives to avoid. We have replaced the majestic, the stately, the charming in furniture and architecture of public buildings with the functional, the boxy, the bland, the windowless. And today we celebrate a window and the light that comes to us from that window. Did you know that the Greek word, root of the word architecture, and I think I've talked to you about this before, literally means the weaving of a higher order. Architecture means the weaving of a higher order. The ancients knew that even the structures that a civilization built communicated their values and their worldview. We should consider what these windowless, graceless edifices in city after city say about our worldview. No, we don't seem to understand the importance of the beautiful in our lives. Imagine that, uh, or imagine that we should demand it. Yet throughout history and across cultures, our human expressions of beauty have been the expressions of the glory of God in art and architecture, music and dance, poetry and literature, photography and sculpture, in the colors and textures of textile art, the brilliance of stained glass, the intricacy of metalwork, copper and silver and platinum and gold, in the swirling grains of life in natural wood. Her beauty speaks as profoundly as truth and as actively as goodness, providing sanctuary for the human soul. There's a lovely piece in O'Donohue's book, sorry folks, you might as well just read the book, right? Because I just keep on quoting. He speaks of the honored place given church buildings and their sanctuaries in former times. I think I cut out some of it, but I think you'll get the point here. In, great, in a great religious tradition, the house of God is a special place. The church, the temple, the mosque is where the community gathers to hear God. When one enters there, one does not simply enter a building. Rather, one enters unknowingly the gathered memory held there. The house is a living archive of transcendence. How about that line? The house is a living archive of transcendence. This is the place where the voice of God becomes audible, where that tranquility which the world cannot give waits to comfort the mind. People have come into this house with burdens of heart that could find healing nowhere else in the world. They have come in here for shelter when storms have unraveled every stitch of meaning in their lives. They have come in too to give thanks for blessings and gifts they could never have earned. The house of God is a frontier region, an, in an intense threshold where the visible world meets the ultimate but subtle structures of the invisible world. We enter this silence and stillness in order to decipher the creative depths of the divine imagination that dreams our lives. And I think we heard that in the psalm today, written in the book, in, written in God's book before we ever became, before we ever manifest ourselves. Today, many months into our separation from the familiar sanctuary of our own church, we've honored the existence of this sacred space by displaying images of sacred art. Our sanctuary is an expression of our particular congregation, its history, its theology, its people. It's rather modest and unadorned in contrast to many church sanctuaries, but it's small, but it's small yet open space lends itself to the given intimacy of our friendly, loving, accepting congregation, which has in the past and for almost 60 years, gathered here week after week to worship and prepare ourselves for the week ahead, teaching and feeding and praying and consoling and encouraging others. This church is full of genuine, open, and faithful people. Its sanctuary is an expression of who we are and have been, and in our genuineness and simplicity, God dwells here in all God's beauty. A desire for aesthetic beauty 
is not in opposition to compassionate heart, to a life of service, to a modest life. Goodness and truth share the world with beauty and depend on its transforming presence. So as we head into our 60th year, in a time of turmoil and divisiveness, hateful speech and actions of illness and agony for some, scarcity for many, fear, as Leanne spoke about last week for most, what power does beauty have to open our hearts ever wider? We may be more somber and subdued, but our joy can be just as full and our hope for a new day even more real. In the year ahead, as we begin the process of safely opening our sanctuary, let us imagine the beautiful, even in the anxiety of our times. The human expressions of beauty we've seen this morning in their balance, texture, harmony, color, came from God and belong in the house of God. They remind us of our collective memory, of a place where year after year people have been welcomed, where infants have been baptized, the ritual of marriage has taken place, where children have been raised and confirmed, where friendships have been formed, where lives have been given solace during times of loneliness and despair, where we have honored and blessed and said goodbye to those we have dearly loved. It's also a place of undetermined future, where people don't People we don't even know, people who haven't yet been born, will enter to approach the divine beauty of God and to share their faith, their lives, and their love with others. It's a place that must stand ready for whatever the future may bring. In our imaginations and memory, even in our Zoom worship, week after week, we step lightly step lightly over a sacred threshold into an invisible world. So I will close with how we began, the words of Paul to the community at Philippi. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen.